A 19-year-old heiress is kidnapped by anarchist rebels, but decides to join the group and help them further their mission to unleash the most devastating revolutionary violence ever imagined. No, this is not the plot of some B-list action movie. This actually happened here in the United States. I'm talking about the kidnapping of Patty Hearst, whose apparently voluntary participation in crimes committed by her kidnappers and subsequent trial shocked the nation and was the first time Stockholm Syndrome was used as a defense in a criminal trial. Did it hold up in court? Let's talk about it. First, a quick thanks to my partner on today's video, Factor. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. And my friends, this is not your grandma's TV dinner, okay? Factor's food is fresh and genuinely really tasty. Like the first time I took a bite of a Factor meal, I said, oh damn. I love that there's no prep and no mess to clean up with Factor meals. Cause y'all, I am busy and I'm not particularly passionate about cooking, but I'm also also trying to be better about caring for my body and my health, so Factor is honestly really quick and easy. Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in two minutes, so I get to eat food I know is fresh and healthy, but Factor also offers a really great variety with a rotating weekly menu of 25 plus meal options. I loved this apricot mustard chicken meal. Like, look at those sear marks. They are genuine and the flavor is so good, they really do not skimp on the flavor. Factor has become my go-to lunch or dinner solution when I'm juggling a million things throughout my day and don't have time to cook. They also have these delicious protein rich smoothies that are so handy when I need to head out the door, but I know I'll need to refuel before I get home. They have a variety of meal plans to choose from, but I personally appreciate that they don't skimp on the calories. Like, sorry, honey, 250 calories does not a meal make. You know what I mean? I come from thick German farmers. I cannot survive on rabbit food and Factor's meals are genuinely satisfying while also being tasty and convenient. Factor is now owned by HelloFresh, so with both brands, I really enjoy the flexibility of being able to cook conveniently with HelloFresh or grab and go with Factor. Love this for me. Head to go.factor75.com slash legia120 and use code legia120 to get $120 off Factor meals today. Patricia Campbell Hurst was born on February 20th, 1954, an Aquarius Pisces cusp, which probably makes her very in tune with the emotions of others, aloof and prone to flights of fancy. Anyway, she was born in San Francisco was the third of five daughters of Ralph Apperson Hearst, the son of William Randolph Hearst. Ever heard of him? He created the largest media empire in the world and was associated with immense political influence and power. Plus, he was stupid wealthy. However, Patty's daddy, old Randolph, was just one of numerous heirs. His father, William Randolph Hearst, had four siblings and four children. So the family was wealthy, but not like fully in control of the Hearst family assets by any means, you know? Anyway, in February of 1974, Patty was a sophomore in college attending the University of California, Berkeley and studying art history. I feel like art history is such a rich girl major, like no shade, but uh, what are you gonna do with that? Huh? I would know. I went to Vassar, okay? Being a rich girl who studies art history is like quintessential Vassar culture. On the night of February 4th, 1974, 19-year-old Patty was hanging out in her apartment on Benvenue Street with her fiance, a guy named Stephen Weed. This was back when it was kind of normal to be engaged at 19. Anyway, they hear a knock at the door, tap, tap, hello. Patty opens the door and a group of men and women shove their way in past her. They were all armed to the teeth. Terrifying. They beat up her fiance, Stephen, tie him up along with a neighbor who tried to help. Then they grabbed Patty, blindfolded her and shoved her into the trunk of their car and drove off. And this shocked the country and hundreds of journalists descended upon the Hearst home, camping out in vans and trucks and reporting around the clock on every development. Three days after her kidnapping, a small group of radicals considered by the FBI to be domestic terrorists that called themselves the Symbionese Liberation Army or SLA, sent a recording to a Berkeley radio station announcing that they were holding Patty hostage as a prisoner of war. The SLA was organized by a guy named Donald DeFreeze. De what? DeFreeze. An escaped convict who went by the name Sinke. The group was small, made up of 11 or 12 people who were anarchists critical of American capitalism and dedicated to the overthrow of the Nixon represented corporate dictatorship. And they saw the Hearst family as a symbol of free market capitalism at its worst, calling them a super fascist ruling class family. They also apparently all used one communal toothbrush? Not sure why 
the revolution has to skimp on toothbrushes, but all right. And they had a jazz funk national anthem. They were also armed and dangerous and dreamed of unleashing the most devastating revolutionary violence ever imagined. Prior to kidnapping Patty, they had shot two Oakland school officials with cyanide tipped bullets, killing one and wounding the other. School officials of all people. During her captivity, Patty was allegedly subjected to coercion and brainwashing and held in the closet in the SLA's apartment hideaway. In their recording announcing that they'd kidnapped Patty, the group demanded that the Hearst family give $70 worth of food to every needy person in California. If the Hearst family did this, the SLA said they would negotiate the return of Patty. All these communications, by the way, were conducted via the media with SLA sending the taped messages and demanding that they be published in all newspapers and all other forms of media, or else they would murder Patty. So Daddy Randolph gave away $2 million worth of food to needy Californians. I guess that's one way to eat the rich. Okay, but it was a disaster. Apparently the way they handed out food was by just throwing it from moving trucks. It caused rioting and looting and journalists who of course were flocking to whatever scene they could cover in this kidnapping case were routinely being attacked. Anyway, SLA then was like, nah, that's not enough and asked for an additional $6 million. The Hearst family said they would comply, but first the SLA had to release Patty unharmed. Then negotiations fell apart, and on April 3rd, 1974, so two months after she was abducted, Patty announced via audio recording that she had decided to join the ranks of the SLA of her own free will and adopted the name Tanya in homage to the martyred lover of Che Guevara. Number one communist hottie, and you can't change my mind. So Patty's like, nah, I'm with them. I'm gonna fight with them. Patty would later testify in court that during this time she was being held blindfolded in a closet until she agreed to join them, and then she was given SLA manifestos to read and memorize while also being repeatedly raped to promote her sexual liberation. But then her story changes at times. At one point she said she was given the option to either leave the SLA or join them, and she chose to join. So only Patty really knows exactly what happened. Two weeks after her announcement that she decided to join ranks with her captors, Patty was spotted in surveillance images holding a semi-automatic rifle and participating in the armed robbery of the Hibernia Bank in San Francisco, which was coincidentally owned by her best friend's father. Two people were shot during the robbery and one person died. She was later spotted robbing a store outside LA. The next day, having determined the location of the SLA hideout, over 100 Los Angeles police officers mounted an armed assault at 1466 East 54th Street. The event was captured by a newfangled invention called the Minicam, which allowed journalists to broadcast live while out in the field. Due to the high profile nature of the case and the live broadcast coverage of the assault, throngs of people gathered near the home. The LAPD told SLA members to come out with their hands up and leave their weapons inside. The SLA members in the house answered by shooting at the cops, which was the start of a two hour shootout between the cops and the SLA members. At one point, tear gas shot into the house by the LAPD started a fire inside, which killed four SLA members in the blaze. Two more were killed as they tried to escape. Afterwards, it was discovered that Patty Hearst was not in the house that day and had fled town with a couple other SLA members the day before. As a side note, 20 years later in 1994, the LA Times posted a story on the 20 year anniversary of the shootout. At that time, the lot where the house once stood was just an empty lot and the owner of it who lived across the street in a house never rebuilt on that lot. Apparently many people in the neighborhood at that time were from Louisiana and had a lot of superstitions about the lot, some claiming that they could hear screams at night coming from it. So she said she never rebuilt because no one would ever live there. A Google Maps search today, however, reveals that a house has since been built in its place. So if you live at 1466 East 54th Street in South Central LA, please let the people know. Is it haunted though? Anyway, back to 1974. After seeing the gunfight on TV, Patty and the other members of the SLA spent the next year on the run zigzagging across the country from coast to coast, somehow avoiding the FBI and the frenzied media until Patty was finally caught on September 18th, 1975, 21 months after she was first kidnapped. She was caught coincidentally in San Francisco where the whole story began. In the days following her arrest, Patty maintained her allegiance to the SLA. However, by the time the trial rolled around on February 4th, 1976, two years to the day after her kidnapping, she had changed her tune, claiming that she was brainwashed and 
feared for her life. Her defense attorney was F. Lee Bailey. If that name sounds familiar, it should. Last week, I talked about the Sam Shepard murder trial. Remember that? Yeah, F. Lee Bailey was the defense attorney that argued before the Supreme Court and won Sam Shepard his freedom. Years after the Patty Hearst trial, F. Lee Bailey would serve as one of O.J. Simpson's defense attorneys, famously cross-examining Detective Mark Furman, the guy who claimed to have found the glove on O.J.'s property, effectively undermining Furman's credibility, which was a key reason why O.J. was acquitted. Yeah, that F. Lee Bailey was Patty Hearst's defense lawyer. His strategy was to attempt to challenge Patty's mental capacity to prove that she was brainwashed and suffered from Stockholm Syndrome at the time of the crime. Which, if you don't remember, is where someone who gets kidnapped then becomes sympathetic to or sometimes falls in love with their captor. Under Bailey's theory, if Patty suffered from Stockholm Syndrome, she was under duress and not a willing and voluntary participant or member of the SLA, including at the time of the robbery, she was being prosecuted for. Okay, but it turns out that strategy kind of sucked. All right, brainwashing was not a recognized defense to the federal crime of armed bank robbery. No one had been found not guilty due to brainwashing. The only way for her to be acquitted was to show a recognized mental illness or incapacity, or that she was acting under duress in an immediate fear for her life. This was hard to prove because the judge allowed the prosecution to use evidence after the fact of the robbery to show Patty's state of mind, including playing tapes for the jury that were recorded after the robbery of Patty defending her actions as something she did of her own free will, saying the idea of brainwashing is ridiculous. On cross-exam, Patty was asked a number of questions about her actions after the bank robbery, during which she pled the fifth 42 times. The defense also was a bit patronizing, calling a number of witnesses to testify about her vulnerability and subjecting her to questions about her sex life and other sensitive subjects. People theorized that Bailey adopted this strategy because her parents wanted that to be the strategy because they couldn't accept the alternative, that Patty had actually voluntarily joined this violent anarchist group and participated in federal crimes. Wildly, the defense attorneys had rejected earlier offers from the prosecution that would have allowed Patty to plead guilty in return for a lenient sentence essentially just probation. So it could have also been that Bailey just didn't think he could lose. And the most damning testimony was the psychiatrist offered by the prosecution named Joel Fort. He questioned whether the defense's psychiatrist could really make any conclusions about what Patty's state of mind was 15 months before they had ever met her. He also said Patty was a prime candidate for radicalization because in grade school, she lied to nuns that her mother had cancer in order to get out of an exam. She had also engaged in sexual activity at an early age. And she had experimented with drugs like LSD. The psychiatrist said she was a lost soul and people like her just floated around and would stick to the first random ideology that they bumped into. So it was no surprise that she willingly joined the SLA. The reality was that at the time of her arrest, Patty weighed just 87 pounds and exhibited signs of serious trauma. Her IQ was measured at 112, even though it had been measured at 130 before. There were huge gaps in her memory and she seemed zombie-like. She was smoking heavily and she suffered from severe nightmares. Multiple psychologists with expertise in brainwashing and coercive persuasion who interviewed her considered her to be brainwashed and compared her to a coerced prisoner of war. At the time, this was not a defined mental illness. PTSD wasn't added to the DSM until 1980, and Stockholm Syndrome has never been recognized by the DSM. So even if this evidence was presented in court, it may have supported the brainwashing theory, but that theory wasn't recognized as a legal defense to armed robbery, so it carried very little weight. In order to support her brainwashing claim, Patty had to take take the stand in her own defense to explain how the brainwashing took place. But jurors didn't find her believable because she seemed robotic and she pled the fifth a lot, which by the way, pleading the fifth isn't supposed to be held against a defendant, but a discussion of whether juries can actually adhere to instructions about compartmentalizing what they hear witnesses say, is a video for another day. And at one point, she testified that a member of the SLA known as Cujo had raped her and that she hated him. But on cross-exam, the prosecution produced a love trinket that she kept in her bag from Cujo. When asked to explain why she kept a gift in her purse from a rapist she hated, she responded that she likes art, though her testimony sometimes was a little weak. The prosecution also presented a recording of Patty saying that Cujo was the gentlest, most beautiful man I've ever known. Cujo was the gentlest, most beautiful man I've ever known. Even with what we know now about the psychology of relationship abuse and how it's not that black and white, the amount of evidence 
was pretty damning in this case. Throughout the months after the robbery, Patty had doubled down repeatedly on the idea that she was devoted to the SLA of her own free will and was not brainwashed in any way. After the close of trial, the jury deliberated for 12 hours and on March 20th, 1976, Patty Hearst was found guilty of armed robbery and use of a firearm to commit a felony. She was sentenced to seven years in prison. One of the psychologists who had interviewed her and seen the level of trauma she was recovering from wrote an open article to President Carter asking him to commute her sentence. And in 1979, President Jimmy Carter commuted her sentence to time served and Patty was released. 22 years later, on the last day of his presidency, Bill Clinton granted Patty a full pardon. Shortly after her release from prison, Patty married her former bodyguard, Bernard Shaw. Her former bodyguard. Talk about Stockholm syndrome. Not that he was holding her captive, but like she fell in love with the armed man who followed her around. Frankly, I wanna know what happened to her during her childhood because something is not right with this picture. You know what I mean? Anyway, Stockholm Syndrome and brainwashing are much better understood psychologically now than they were in the 1970s. However, our legal system still has a hard time allowing for brainwashing, which is also known as coercive control, to be a valid defense in criminal cases, often requiring duress as a defense to a crime, which requires the defendant to show that they had an immediate, reasonable fear for their safety, which isn't often the case when someone who is brainwashed commits a crime willingly due to their brainwashing. Basically, in order for it to be used as a valid defense, it would need to be pretty explicitly laid out by lawmakers in the way that the lawmakers write the criminal code. For example, like robbery is illegal. However, it's a defense to the crime of robbery if the accused can show that they were being coercively controlled at the time the crime was committed. As far as I know, that's not a common defense written into statutes. So it's hard to say whether Patty would be much more successful were this trial to occur today. Today, Patty is 68. She has two children, Jillian and Lydia Hurst, who is a model and actress. Patty has written books, become an active philanthropist, and she has pretty iconically, appeared in a number of John Waters films, including Cry Baby, Serial Mom, Pecker, Cecil B. Demented, and A Dirty Shame. And that, my friends, is the wild ride of the Patty Hearst kidnapping and trial. Do you think brainwashing should be a more commonly recognized defense to criminal activity, especially in light of other criminal cults that have gone to trial recently, like Nexium, for example? Comment below. I'd love to know your thoughts. Thanks again to Factor for partnering with me on today's video. Reminder to head to go.factor75.com slash 120 and use code Legia 120 to get $120 off Factor Meals today. If you found this video interesting, you might like my video from last week where I talk about the Johnny Depp defamation case and how media frenzies shape trials. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye bye.